Would you open your Bibles, if you brought one, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, or on your uh, iPhone, or your flat screen TV that you brought, whatever you have. Uh, you have been going through the Gospel of Mark. Pastor Joe, I understand, covered chapter 13 last week. And as Pastor John mentioned, the return, oh my goodness, I, I don't know that I've ever been more, more serious, more aware, more sensitive to the reality. I mean, uh, John and I have been teaching this subject for many years uh, and talking about it for many years, but it's different. It's different this time. It's, it's, re, it's coming ho close to home a lot more. And so I pray that, as Pastor Joe taught last, last week, that you be ready, be ready, be prepared, be aware, be diligent in the things of the Lord. Would you pray with me before we get started? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus, just praying. You said that we should pray about everything. Your son Jesus told his disciples to pray um, so that they would not give up. And so we pray. We lift up this time to you and ask that whatever it, there is in Mark chapter 14, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts by your spirit. And Lord, that you would minister to us right where we need it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The story is told of a man that worked at a factory. And this man, he had a wheelbarrow. And as he's leaving work, he's got to go past the guard gate. So he pushes his wheelbarrow up to the guard gate. The guard says, stop. What do you got there? Got a wheelbarrow. I, I see that, but what's in the wheelbarrow? He said, there's a box, a little box. What's in the box? And, and the, the guy goes, opens it, pulls down sawdust. And the guard looks at him and says, sawdust? What is that about? Well, you know, they clean up after work, and they sweep everything up, and they put the, I need some sawdust at home. So he puts the box back into the wheelbarrow, pushes the wheelbarrow out. Second day, same thing. Same exact thing. Third day, fourth day, pushes up the wheelbarrow, same exact thing. The guy goes, you again? Yeah. Same box? Same box. What do you got in there? Sawdust. Oh, God. Go, get out of here. Fifth day, the guy comes up, pushing the wheelbarrow, the guard stops him. He goes, okay, I've had it. I've had it. You're stealing something. I don't know what you're stealing, but I, I know you're stealing something. I'll make you a deal. You tell me what you're stealing, and I won't report you. So the worker says, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story, isn't it? <laughs> but Fidel, what's the point? The point is this. The guard had a very small perspective. He was just looking at the little box. Hey, hey, hey uh, guard, guard, guard that's working at the gate, take a step back and get a broader perspective. You're missing the big picture. I've entitled our time together, Your Perspective of Jesus is Priority. Because every now and then, if not always, maybe it's just me, I, I, I can find myself just focusing in on my life, my family, my finances, my problems, my health. My future, my career, 
And so often in my case, life becomes this right here. And that's all I see. And there's a whole world of activity going on around me. And I'm asking you, uh, you'll see what I mean when we look at uh, Mark chapter 14, but I'm asking you to mentally, emotionally, spiritually, take a step back and ask yourself, am I missing anything? There's so much going on in the world right now. There's so much that is happening that we need to take a step back and, and, and understand, like Romans chapter 13, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, do this, understand the times in which we're living. Your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. And so we look at Mark chapter 14 with that understanding, the perspective. You'll, you'll see what I mean. We'll look at the, we're going to read the first 11 verses. That's the area that we'll cover today. And then we'll come back and kind of make some comments along the way. <clears throat> In verse 1, Mark says, the past, I'm reading from the New International Version. It reads a little bit easier for me. The Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. The chief priest and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly, wanted to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he, Jesus, was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? Could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. They rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime, anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elite, the leaders, the rulers had a plan. Got to kill them. We, we need to get rid of them. It's not the first time, not the first time that we see that they had that intention. No. In John chapter 5, Verses 17 and 18, it says that the Jewish leaders sought for ways in which they could kill him. In John chapter 8, verses 57 and 58, it says that the, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees actually, the Bible says, picked up stones and they wanted to stone him to death. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11 and verse 53, it's Caiaphas, the high priest. Him and his cronies. They're looking for ways in which they can, they're plotting, it says, for ways in which they can kill him. What was he, dear religious leader? What, what, what was the problem? He's a threat. We got to eliminate him from society. We need to exclude him expel, extract him. He poses a threat to our position, to our power. And so we must do away with him. 
You know what's interesting is it's the same thing that's happening today in many ways, in many ways. I'm, I'm not going to jump on a soapbox here and preach to you about the wickedness of society. You, you, you know all that. But it's a fact. It's reality. Much of this world is seeking to do what the religious leaders did back in that day. We need to get rid of Jesus. Jesus. See, back in those days, the the rabbis, the teachers of the law, the chief priests, no problem talking about we're Abraham's descendants. No problem talking about uh, Yahweh, God the Father. No no problem with that. But but Jesus, that's, that's a different story. Isn't it the same today? Isn't it the same today that you can, and not a not a big problem, not a big issue with talking about God. You can even say you believe in the Bible, but, but have you ever narrowed it down in a conversation where you say, but, but see, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus. Oh, <laughs> the temperature in the room changes quickly, <laughs> quickly. Something about that name. Now, why do I say that? Because you already know all that. Well, because the perspective that we have, uh, I'm asking you to take a step back from your circle of life. And I want to remind you, I I, want to refresh your memory that we are here on this planet as Christians. If you've not given your heart to Jesus yet, then that's a different story. But for you as a believer, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You, the believer, What does light do? Shows the way. Pierces the darkness. Jesus said, you don't take a lamp, light it, and put it under a table. No, we as Christians, we're supposed to let our light shine. See, the the perspective is that Jesus is the priority of our life. But preacher, you don't understand. (laughs) I got so many problems. I got so many things going on in my life right now that the thought of really getting serious, <coughs> the thought of <clears throat> really getting serious with the Lord, I wish I could. I just, my kids, my job, my job, my family, whatever. But we're living in these times now when the reality of Scripture needs to come to life in our life. This is real. It's, it's unfolding before our very eyes. The things that are happening globally, this is, we're to be the, the light of the world and, and the salt of the earth to people, to this lost world. And there is a time, and, and, and I don't, like I said, I apologize, but I, I don't want to get on a soapbox. I, I, I don't, but I just want to, because of the urgency that I, that I feel, that I see, that many of you as well, that there has to be a time when we take a stand for what we believe it in this time now. It's what Daniel did in the book of Daniel in chapter 1. This young man is taken from his homeland all the way over to Babylon, hundreds of miles away. (coughs) And he's given the opportunity. And he don't mind the classes. He don't mind wearing the the garb that they wore. But then they they bring food and they, they put it in front of him. And, and it's there in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 where, where Daniel says, uh, I, I may go to your school and I may wear your, your garb, but see, the Bible says that that's unclean. And Daniel, in a foreign place as a young teenager, the Bible says in verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart, I'm not going to defile myself. And we're living in these days where it's so easy to just go with the flow. We don't want to be that odd man out. We don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. We want to be accepted. We want to keep the job. We want to uh, move forward in the career. And so 
are we just settling for the way things are? Or the three Hebrew young men in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that uh, you, the king Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't, when you hear the, the sound of the music, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fire. And these three young men, the Bible says that they, they, not one, but they, the three of them, said to the king, we don't even need to really talk to you about this. But here's what we're going to tell you. We serve a God that is able to keep us from that furnace. But even if he does not, we're not bowing down to your false God. Amen. We're at that place, I think, where some of us, some of us, without fear, without reservation, not in a foolish way, not, not in a prideful way, but in a biblical way, say, listen, boss, I'll do that, but I'm not doing that. Because in the Bible it says, taking the step back and looking at the bigger picture that your life is more than a job. Your life is more than a career. Your life is more than just what you want, but, but is your life centered around the priority of Jesus? I wrote it this way, if you like to write things down, improper perspective can blind you to the reality of Jesus, and that's what happened to these religious leaders. They saw him as a threat. They saw him as a negative. Got to get rid of him. Improper perspective. Look with me at verse 3. While he, Jesus, was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the... I don't know why, but I love that, that, that scene. Jesus is reclining at the home of Simon the leper. He's just hanging out. A woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure spikenard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She's got a different perspective of Jesus. Religious leaders, chief priests, get rid of him. Move him out. Remove him. There's a woman. Now, probably, we're not going to get into all of the, the who is she, is she this, is she. Probably uh, the, the woman from John chapter 12. Probably Mary, Martha's sister. Because in John chapter 12, they're in Bethany, and now they're in Bethany, and you see the story of Mary pouring the uh, fragrant oil on Jesus in John chapter 12. So it's probably Mary. But this woman comes in. I don't know if she's invited. I don't know if she's crashing the party. But, but something causes her to come to this. And I want you to see that Jesus is reclining at the home of Simon the leper. Isn't that a cool picture? Somewhere along the line, he healed this Simon. Because I'm sure he's not leprous anymore. And in return, to me, it seems that, that Simon the leper recognizes Jesus has touched me. His perspective is Jesus has done a work in my life. Jesus has changed me. I'm not the same person I used to be <coughs> since I came into contact with Jesus. I'm different. And the response to that is that he wants to give. He wants to open his house. Hopefully he told his wife, hey, Jesus is coming over. <laughs> but the response to having been touched haven't been impact, uh, impacted, haven't been changed is, I, I want to open my, my house. I want to give. I want to show you, Jesus, how grateful I am for you having touched me. I, I pray that you're the same. But this woman, she, she's got the same, I think, attitude. She comes in, and, and, and Jesus is reclining. Uh, he, he's there at the table. Now, again, this is not like 
uh, four chairs and a table. This is literally reclining on the floor. It's how they did it custom culturally back in the day. So this woman comes in. And I want you to notice that she's got a jar of very expensive perfume, an alabaster jar. This expensive perfume historically probably came from India, was imported. What's her perspective? I I wrote it this way, verse 3, proper perspective of Jesus causes you to give all to him. This, This jar of perfume is very expensive. You'll see that it's worth a year's wage. And this is not like she went down to the department store and picked out a a bottle of perfume. This kind of spikenard, this kind of fragrant perfume is something that might have been handed down from one generation to another generation. This is expensive. This is precious. This is costly. This is something that maybe, maybe this is that investment into her her future for retirement's sake. It was that expensive. And so she comes and, and, and she breaks this alabaster jar. And, and in tradition, historically, culturally, if, if, this, if you and I are living back in these days and you came to visit me and I happen to have some of this expensive perfume, I'm not going to pour it on you. Oh, no, no, no. See, I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a little bit like this. I'm going to dab it because it, this, this, this is like top shelf stuff. Expensive. This is, this is family heirloom. I'm, I'm going to just dab a little tiny bit like that and just anoint you to welcome you into my home. This lady <laughs> takes the, the jar and breaks it and pours it on his head. What is her perspective? Jesus, I'm giving you everything. There's three words that came to my mind as, as I saw this act on this woman's behalf. First of all, it was very personal. This is something from her her heart. She didn't go to her financial manager and say, hey, uh, what do you think? I'm thinking about breaking this alabaster jar and pouring it over Jesus. You think that'd be a good investment? What do you think about that? (laughs) This is something that was prompted inwardly. Nobody forced her. Nobody twisted her arm. Nobody manipulated her. Nobody coerced her and got some music going in the background and, and give every. This is just, it's in my heart. Maybe appreciation. Maybe. God, I'm so grateful for, I'm so grateful for what you've done. How could I not? How could I not give you everything? Not only was it personal, but, but it cost her something. It was sacrificial. This is her perspective. As she steps back and she sees who Jesus really is, she goes, this is, this is costly. This is something that is expensive, and it's dear to me, and it's precious to me. Maybe been in my family for a long time, but it doesn't matter. See, I'm, I'm doing it from my heart, and I'm not holding anything back. I'm giving him everything. It's his anyway. Maybe she knew Psalm 24, the Lord, the earth belongs to God and everything in it belongs to him. She did it personally. She did it sacrificially. And it was a total, complete. She broke the, the jar. There's no going back. She, she can't go back and say, hey, wait, wait, wait. I was only kidding. Can, can I have some of that? I want some of that oil back. Oh, she just, everything, total. It costs her something. It, it's what you read in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24. It's David. King David. Says to Joab, the army commander, hey, Joab, I want you to go throughout the land all the way from uh, Dan to Beersheba, and I want you to count all of the 
uh, fighting men that we have. And, and Joab, uh, a good, you, you need a, a friend like this. Joab said, King, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think you ought to do that. No, no, you go ahead. You go. You go and count all the men. Nine months, nine and a half months, Joab is gone. He comes back. Well, we got this many thousand, this many thousand. And immediately, David knew, I made a mistake. It was pride. Oh, look how much I have. And, and, and the Lord brought judgment. That's a long story. Chapter 24, you can read it later. The Lord brought judgment because of David's actions, and so much so that 70,000 people lost their lives. And the prophet Gad came to David and said, you want to you see this play again? Yeah. Then go, go to the house of a man named Aruna and build an altar there on the property, on his property. So David goes. Aruna sees David coming. He, Aruna falls on his face. Uh, and King, what is it? What, 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 what are you do? What's up? What are you doing here? I've, I've come here to build an altar that the plague may stop. And Aruna, out of the goodness of his heart, here, take it. You can have it. Take the land. Here, here's the cows. Here's the oxen for the sacrifice. Here's the wood. Take the, here, here's all the wood that you'll need. It's all free. And I love David's response. David says, far be it from me that I would ever offer anything up to the Lord that doesn't cost me something. Hebrews chapter 13 says, offer up a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes we need to take a step back and go, this is going to cost, but, but Jesus is worth it. And only you know what that might be. I'm not talking so much financially. That could be part of it. It could be a forgive somebody, a sacrifice. But it's an act of worship. So she goes. She doesn't go to her financial counselor. What would he have said? What would the financial manager have said? You want to do what? That's your future. You need to store it up for a rainy day and hold on to that. Mary, are you sure? Are you, are you going through one of your phases again? She didn't do that. She was willing. So her per perspective caused her to give all to him. Look at verse 4. Some of those present we're saying indignantly to one another. <laughs> They're talking to each other. Why this waste? Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Hmm. So, you're in the room. You're watching this, and you see this woman pull out this jar, and you see her, and you know what it is. You know, you know what it is. This is some expensive stuff. And she takes and she pours this oil on his head. And you're sitting there with two, three, four, five other people. And your response is not one, like it says in the book of Romans chapter 12, rejoice with those that rejoice. And mourn with those that mourn. No. You're, you're not into this act that this woman is doing of sacrificially giving. No, you look at your, you look at the buddy next to you and then you go, hey, I got a question for you. What do you think about what that lady just did? How do you, how do you feel about what she just did? And then you say, well, interesting that you should ask. Because I was going to ask you what you thought. What is their perspective? I wrote it this way. Improper perspective can lead to being critical instead of supportive. Armchair quarterback. It doesn't, I don't read. Maybe they did. Maybe they did and I missed it. If I did, I apologize. But I don't see anywhere here 
where they, these, these people that are being indignant about this act, I don't read anywhere where they gave to Jesus, where they participated in something sacrificial. No, they got their hands in their pocket. And they're looking at that person that's doing something. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's right. And, and, and there's a lot. There's many. There's people like that. Dio Moody, I, I love. He was being criticized by this person because of the way he did evangelism. And so this person is just, I don't agree with how you do evangelism. I don't agree. I don't like the way you do evangelism. And so Dio Moody uh, says this. It's clear that you don't like my way of doing evangelism. However... I like my way of doing evangelism better than your way of not doing evangelism. Hmm. Critical. I wonder if maybe these guys, these people that are being critical, I wonder if one of them would, would have just taken a moment and said, I wonder why she did that. Maybe before I criticize, maybe I should take a moment and just investigate. Before I point a finger and pass judgment on what they're doing, maybe I ought to make an appointment with somebody and just go, hey, listen, I, I don't understand. I, I, I want to. I want to understand, but I don't understand. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17. Jesse, the father, says to David, the little boy at that point, hey, I want you to take this, these loaves of bread to your brothers that are up on the, uh, they're fighting against the Philistines, you know, the whole Goliath thing. And, and I want you to take this cheese and give it to the commander. So David uh, does what his father told him to do. He goes to the line there, the battle line, and, and he connects with his brothers. He finds his brothers. And the older brothers, I, they could be they're already angry or jealous because the little runt was the one that was anointed the next king of Israel and not them. But when he, David shows up with these, the, these, uh, this food, they look at David and they go, David, why have you come here? <clears throat> with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. <laughs> what? How did you come up with that? He just, he's bringing you food. He's doing what, what he was told to do. Did you, did you even bother asking a question? Hey, hey brother, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. This is dangerous. Why are you here? No, no, no. I know why you're here. You're evil. You got a wicked heart. You just want to see what's going on. That was, that was not the case. But how quickly it is that we can pass judgment. The book of Romans says, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? Can I make a suggestion that when your perspective is focused solely on Jesus, you take a step back and you go, I don't know why they did that. I don't know why he said that. I'll just, let, me, let me pray. Let me pray. Instead of so quickly jump into a conclusion. Look with me at verse 6. We're almost done. <clears throat> Leave her alone, said Jesus. Hmm, don't you love that? Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with, with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. I, I would underline this next part in verse 8. I, I just love this. Jesus said, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand in prayer, uh, to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done um, will also be told in memory of her. I, I wrote this 
proper perspective recognizes, recognizes the battle belongs to the Lord. The, the, this woman is, they, they consider it a waste. Let me tell you, nothing that you do for Jesus will ever be a waste. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, stand firm. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your work for him is not in vain. Improper perspective says, you're, you're, I, that's, that's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort. It's a waste of money. But when you're doing it as unto the Lord, this woman doesn't answer the critics. I, 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 I think, me personally, that she, she could hear the guys, the people being critical, I think. But she doesn't look at them while she's pouring the oil and, and say, what's the matter with you? What's your problem? No, see, that's me defending myself. The battle belongs to the Lord. It's, first, it's Acts chapter 16. One of my favorite, complete favorite areas of Scripture, Paul and Silas in prison. They're, they're there simply because they did something good. They brought healing to a demon-possessed girl. And the people rejected, resented that, and they threw him in a, in a pit and put him in stocks beat them, struck them, whipped them. And they're there stuck in these stocks, bloodied. And the Bible says that at midnight, they were singing unto the Lord. Isn't that incredible? Talk about perspective. Been treated unfairly. This is unjust what you've done. Yeah, but see, God's still on the throne. And so as they're singing with that proper perspective and understanding of who the Lord is, what is it that happens? The prison doors by themselves open up because the Lord took over the battle. They focused on the Lord. We're going to worship in spite of this, no matter what they said, no matter what they did, no matter how they spoke of us, no matter how they treated us, we're still going to worship the Lord. We're still going to glorify his name. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. And you, you know the story from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat. There, there, there's a, a vast army coming against him. And they tell him, hey, King, we got problems. Houston, there's a problem. There's a vast army. And, and Jehoshaphat enters into this incredible prayer. But at the end, he, he goes, Lord, we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. Perspective. And the prophet Jehaziel says to, to Jehoshaphat, listen, go out and, uh, and, and uh, uh, line up for battle. But understand something, king, the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And so what did King Jehoshaphat do? <laughs> he sends out the worship leaders out in front so that as the enemy is approaching, all they see is these people worshiping and singing. Can you imagine? You're part of the worship team. And David, uh, King Jehoshaphat, comes to you and says, hey, listen, I uh, got some good news. Got some bad news. The good news is that the battle belongs to the Lord. Ah, oh, fantastic, great. The bad news is you got to go up front and lead the charge. You got to face the enemy first. And as the worship team goes and is singing, the Lord picks up the battle. You're trusting me. I see how you're trusting me. I see how you're worshiping. And in that, the Lord brought victory. The Lord took over the battle. This woman, if it's Mary, she's just worshiping. Lord, I hear him. I can hear, I can hear the criticism. But I'm worshiping you. And Jesus says, leave her alone. He stands up like a big brother. You got to go through me. I'm her defense. Look with me, last verse, verse 10. Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. 
So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Finally, I, I wrote this, improper perspective can lead you down the path of regret. Judas, what a fool. In John chapter 12, he, he, he's the one that's saying, hey, this money should have been, uh, th this perfume should have been sold and the money given um, to the poor. And then Gospel of John, the commentary says, he, he said this because he was the keeper of the money and he just wanted to steal the money. Um, Judas, th this is going to lead you down a path of regret. He regretted. He, he regretted what he did through the money, the temple priest for having betrayed Jesus. But Jesus gave him the, that final chance there on the uh, Garden of Gethsemane when Judas approached. Jesus said to him, friend. That, that was an opportunity. Go ahead and do what you came to do quickly. Do it quickly. Can I just leave you with this thought? Please reconsider your path. If you're on a path that, is, that, that it could lead you to regret, uh, I have the scars. Many of you have the scars of having gone down the path of regret. And some of you, maybe one of you could come up here and go, let me tell you, don't, don't. if you're on the path that's going to lead you uh, into an area of sin, in your, let me tell you, you need to stop because let me tell you what happened to me. How many of us would be able to tell that story? Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, he said, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever it is that you're planting into the ground, that's what you're going to harvest. Let me leave you with these five last points. Number one, you're called, you're called to be a light to the world, to make an impact. We saw that from the first verse. Number two, you're called to give to the Lord your best in all that you do. We saw that with the woman. Number three, you're called to leave the judging to the Lord because only he knows the heart. Don't be like these guys that misjudge this woman's attitude or motive. Number four, you're called to let the Lord fight your battles that he may get the glory. And lastly, you're called, you're called to avoid the pathway of regret. Perspective. Step back. Step back from your everyday doldrums of life, your everyday activity, your job. Step back and look at what God is doing, not just in your circle of life, but take a step back and go, Lord, Am I missing anything? I got problems, Lord. I got issues. But is there something that you want to minister to me about? Is there something you want to show me? And if you're here and you've never given your heart to Jesus, can I just say, you're here today because you need to hear, you need to hear that, that he loves you. He cares for you and has an incredibly wonderful plan for your life. But because we're sinners, and we're all sinners, sin separates you from God's ability to bless your life, to bring salvation. So we repent. We turn from that. I know that's an old word, right? Repent. But we turn. We stop walking away from God, and we begin to walk towards him. And lastly, the Bible says, to all who receive him, to them God gave the right to be called children of God. So you receive him. What is that? Just a prayer. God, I'm a sinner. I've been living without you. But today I want to receive you into my life. Forgive me for my sin. Save me. Put my name down in the book of life. That when I die, I can spend all eternity with you.